Hello, survivors. This is your girl, Abby Ayola Williams, and you're now listening to How to Survive Society. How to Survive Society is a weekly podcast that features survivors. These are people that have been through the ringers in life. They've been through hell and back, but they choose to stay positive. They choose to win. They choose to thrive and they choose to survive. So let's get right into it. Hello, survivors. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of How to Survive Society. Today, I have a very special guest. His name is Ian Williams. We actually have the same last name. That's (laughs) it. He's an author, speaker, and a business advisor. So, we're going to get to know him and hear about his book, um, how he helps organizations and individuals to, you know, to live a better life, pretty much. So, Ian, nice to have you here. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me, Abby. Looking forward to it. Yes. So um, I usually like to dive you know, backwards. You know, you said you had a single mystical event at the age of 24. <laughs> Can you explain more what that is about? Yeah, let's rip the Band-Aid off. Um, <laughs> I, I owned a, uh, a little pity, a little pit bull. And she was the love of my life for about six years. And, uh, but she wasn't the most stable of, of, of animals. And so over those six years, there was a number of, you know, dog fights, dog bites, people bites, et cetera. And, um, as a family, we did as much as we could. Uh, and on December 30th of 2013, we made the difficult decision to let her go. Um, I guess we made the decision before that, but that was the day that we actually let her go. We brought her to the vet for the final time. And at that time, I mean, a little context for the listener. At this point, I was probably 10 years deep into substance use. Um, And so it was just, I mean, naturally a traumatic event for anybody out there who's had to let go of a pet, particularly let go of a pet earlier than they feel like they should. Um, I was at home in bed one night. Um, it was the middle of the night. I had woken up from uh, a dream that I had had and I was unable to fall back asleep. And so I was just laying on my back and mm. I was staring at the ceiling. Um, and I used to sleep with her every night. I mean, she would sleep under the covers with me, literally. And mm. uh, for anyone who's owned a pet, they know that there's this period in the home where it still feels odd to not have them around. And I was mm. definitely still in that period. I mean, this is just a couple of days after we let her go. And so I heard her nudge the door open like she always did. And I felt her kind of walk into the room and she hopped up on the bed next to me. And wow. I didn't think anything of it. I turned and I looked at her and I could see her and I could hear her, but she didn't make an imprint on the mattress. Mm. And uh, she curled up next to my head and she let out her patented sigh, which she did every night which meant like, I'm ready to go to sleep now. Hmm. And I rolled over to face her and I fell asleep. Wow. And I woke up the next morning uh, and I was using journaling at the time to really process a lot of my emotions. Mm-hmm. And so I started writing about the experience as if it were a dream. And as I was writing, I realized I was awake when that happened. Wow. Uh, and it was a, you know, I, I jokingly say, but I'm also very serious. It was a good thing I was home alone. Mm -hmm. Um, I had the most cathartic, ugly cry of my life um, Mm -hmm. because it just completely, I mean, it completely shattered my perception of what reality was, you know, and it was, it was so touching and it was so moving and it was so profound. I mean, I don't know how else to describe it other than a mystical experience. Um, So that really, yeah, it was absolutely a turning point in my life. It was a, it was a moment of transformational change. Wow, that's <laughs> the... and you were sure you were awake when that happened. One hundred percent positive. Um, wow. I was reading a book at the time entitled "Of Soil and Spirit" by Maladoma mm-hmm. Patrice Somme, mm-hmm. and I was in, um, I was in a passage in the book where he had, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, he had escaped 
um, uh, the boarding school that he was in and he had made it back to his village in Africa and he was essentially going through the rite of passage mm -hmm. but it was um it was a risky time and it was a risky thing to do at that time in his life because he had already kind of surpassed the age which they normally um, initiate the boys in their village and mm -hmm. I was reading in the book about um, what was happening to him in the forest at that time the night prior and, you know, I've always, I've often wondered if that had some sort of uh, impact on my experience that night, because I was reading mm -hmm. about somebody else's profound or mystical experiences, but yeah, I'm, I'm a, I'm a hundred percent certain I was awake and, you know, I've never really, um, I certainly had a lot of people question the experience over time. And it's just been mm -hmm. something that's been so sacred to me that I've never felt the need to defend it. I absolutely yeah. um, know it was a real experience. Yeah, of course. Only you would know because nobody was there with you. Nobody saw what you saw. So no one can tell you that, oh, you're being crazy for saying this. Like, you just can't because you weren't there. So you don't know, <laughs> you know? So mm. I, I do understand why you feel like you don't have to defend yourself to nobody about that. So um, earlier you were saying... Um, when you had to let your dog go, um, you were already 10 years deep into drugs. And um, so, so what kind of drug was it? And why did you start using drugs? In many ways, it was uh, anything I could get my hands on. Um, hmm. You know, my, my drug of choice, and I, I'm always a little hesitant to use the word addict and talk about my experiences in that way, because um, I'm aware that there are people out there who have much more traumatic drug use and abuse stories mm -hmm. and experiences and histories than I do. Um, I smoked a lot of reefer. I drank mm -hmm. a lot of, I drank a lot of alcohol and mm -hmm. then I was, you know, just opportunistic with whatever I could get my hands on whenever it was at the party or, or mm -hmm. whatever like that. Um, I was using, like I said, at that point, I was about 10 years deep and I didn't know it in the beginning of my use, which started at the age of 13, mm -hmm. but I was masking, I was self-medicating for depression and anxiety. Um, mm. which I had been experiencing since much earlier in childhood, but again, I wasn't aware of it at the time. And so that's kind of where it started for me. You know, I, I discovered it in my adolescence, like I think many adolescents do. And it was a matter of probably two weeks from like mm. the first time I started smoking until the time in my life where I was smoking every day, all day. So it was a super quick um, kind of uptake period. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just testament to the addictive nature of my personality. Mm -hmm. um, there are absolutely medical components to this for people out there, if, you know, if you're, if you're still wondering. Um, and so it was largely, like I said, self-medicating for, you know, mental and emotional um, turmoil, but it was also a lifestyle choice and it was also a way to escape, you know, mm -hmm. the feelings that I was um, just not wanting to feel. So it was in total 12 years of my life. At this point, I'm happy to say I'm seven and a half years in recovery um, wow, and sobriety. Okay. And so that's, that's wonderful. But at the same time, you know, anybody who um, is listening or who has dealt with addiction in the past or mm -hmm. has watched someone deal with addiction and sobriety, you know, I think it's, it's a little tempting to think mm -hmm. that once you're sober, life automatically gets better. Mm. And uh, the reality for me was that that wasn't the case. You know, the reality was as soon as I got sober, I started to have to deal with all of the mental and emotional stuff that started to surface, which I had mm. been suppressing for the 12 years before. Mm. Um, and, you know, one of those things was the experience with my dog, but there were many other things as well. And that, uh, it was just a pivotal time in life as I was knowingly ready to be done with my substance use, mm -hmm. really struggling in order to just put it down yes. and also starting to accept and face the fact that if I wanted to offer, you know, the world, everything that I felt like I had to offer, I was really going to need to do some deep digging internally to figure out what was holding me back. Hmm. So do you know what was causing your anxiety and depression 
when you were a teenager? I've thought a lot about this over the years, Abby. Um, mm -hmm. I, I had a very stable childhood. Um, mm -hmm. I'm white identifying, cisgendered, heterosexual. Mm -hmm. uh, and that created an insulative bubble for me, which I wasn't aware of. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think like, and I think we could, well, we could absolutely talk about white privilege, but I'll, I'll set that aside for now. Um, <laughs> I had a very stable childhood, you know, yes. um, I had a nuclear family that was intact. I lived mm -hmm. in pretty much the same house my entire life. You know, we always had uh, a family dog. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it was stable. Parents had stable jobs. You know, by and large, we were a functional family. Mm -hmm. And I, I think a large uh, reason, part of the reason why I started using was because I, I actually felt so stable. My mm -hmm. surroundings, my physical environment felt so stable that I actually wanted to create a little bit of chaos. Mm. And that substance use was something that I could do to create a little bit of chaos in my life. But of course, it took me a few years to realize I actually had a lot of internal chaos. Mm. And I think that the depression and the anxiety started in childhood, mm -hmm. um, but I couldn't necessarily pinpoint a specific, you know, event. Yes. Um, you know, again, I'm, I'm always just like I'm hesitant to use the word addict. Um, I'm, I'm always hesitant to use the word trauma. Um, mm -hmm. And I understand that trauma exists on a continuum, but certainly there are people out there who had much more traumatic experiences than I did growing up in childhood. Yeah, it, it's funny that you said that, that you had a stable home, you had, a, you had stable parents, your parents were together, and you didn't have any step siblings or any divorce, nothing like that happened to you. But yet you still um, were going through depression and, and anxiety. So it's like, how do parents win in this life, you know? Because I have children myself and I try my best to give them a stable, uh, you know, household and, and all that great stuff. But it's like, what can parents do to help their children? Because it's like, no matter what you do, I'm speaking as a parent now, you know, not as a, a child, but it's like, no matter what you do, your child will still feel like some kids will still feel like they're not enough. Or is it because they're bored or is it because they haven't found their purpose yet? Like, I'm just asking this question out loud. I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know the answer. It's like, oh, at least like you can never win. <laughs> yeah. I mean, from a, so I am not a parent uh, yet. Mm -hmm. Um, but I can speak from my experience as a child, yes. um, you know, and, and naturally I went through a pretty rough patch with my family, uh, mm -hmm. sister included and both my parents for, you know, the better part of two decades, honestly. And the one thing that I think was most profoundly supportive that they provided for me was patience. Mm they gave me um, room to roam. Many people told them they gave me too much room to roam. Hmm. But the reality, looking back on it was, you know, had they clamped down any harder, mm -hmm. I would have just pushed back that much harder. Mm. Um, and, you know, I'm relentless and I'm stubborn. And so I think they sensed intuitively just with a, you know, kind of parental awareness and intuition Yes. We need to just give him space to work this out. And they were mm. eternally patient. And I know that there are other people out there who did not have that familial experience, right? Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. You know, even in families where addiction is not a topic or a family dynamic, it's like you turn 18, get out of the house, right? Um, yeah. I did not have that experience. And, and that room to roam and mm -hmm. that patience, as challenging as I'm sure it was for them, um, it was important for me because I always felt like I had a safe space to go back to, even mm. when I was putting myself in unsafe situations or being unsafe, you know, internally, emotionally, and mentally with myself, mm -hmm. um, that was amazingly supportive to your, to kind of change lanes a little bit. 
um, mm-hmm. and to maybe address your point as a parent. Mm-hmm. I think the other thing that we need to consider at this at this time is, mm-hmm. you know, culture and society, right? I mean, mm-hmm. like the name of your podcast, How to Survive Society. We're yes. in, um, and and I, I want to be clear, like every generation has the same narrative. It's just different content, right? Like mm-hmm. you're, you're um, alive in 19 you know, 50, you had your own narrative of whatever it looked like. If you were alive in 1850, you had your own narrative of, of whatever it looked like. I mean, it's all about context, but we're in an era right now, societally, where there's a lot of cultural messages around, um, what it means to be a good person, what it means to be a beautiful person, what it means to be a healthy person, um, what it means to be an important person, how to live life the right way. And children are sponges. I mean, that's literally what your neural network is designed to do in childhood is to learn, uptake information, form um, an understanding of the world. And I, I'm specifically not using the terms beliefs and opinions because I think those come later in life, right? Once we can actually start thinking about our thinking, but that's what children are designed to do. And children always live in a society that is sending particular messages and those messages are going to be different depending on the context of where that child is growing up and you know what their childhood looks like and what century it is etc but had i taken a little more time earlier in life or been provided with a little bit more guidance to start my self discovery process earlier i think i may have been able to kind of short change that um, learning curve with addiction and recovery, because for me, that process of change didn't happen until I said, you know what, I've got to get curious about myself. I've got to really start caring about what's happening inside me, because if I don't care about it, I'm never going to understand it. And if I don't understand it, I'm never going to be able to effectively deal with it. And those things were essential pieces to my own transformational change process. And so to your point about, you know, how do parents win? I think it's understanding there's, there's obviously a dance. And again, I'm not speaking as a parent, but there's a balance to be found in terms of providing enough space for your child or children to become their own individual because they're going to anyway, whether you like it or not. And also recognizing that they're creating that identity of self they're creating their experience of the world within the context of a society and a culture that you don't have control over and you know my parents taught me a whole bunch of things growing up which now I feel differently about you know um, I have different opinions than them and that's the beauty of being an individual and it's actually made us closer um, as as a family unit, because there's more diverse perspectives in the household. So, you know, providing that space, providing a supportive foundation, but also recognizing the context and the container in which it's all happening inside of, you know, society itself. Um, These things are just essential. And if I could have, you know, I, I don't spend a lot of time thinking, you know, back to the past. Oh, I wish I had done that. I wish I'd done this. Um, If I could have changed any one thing about my parents' parenting style, it would have been more questions like you just asked. Where do you think this is coming from? You know, because those would have been seeds planted to get me to start doing the self-reflection process, Mm -hmm. which is ultimately what allowed me to develop the tools and the skill sets I needed to get myself out of, you know, the, the hole that I had dug for myself, so to speak. Mm. so what tools were those like how did you dig yourself out of it and I know now you're helping organizations to do the same thing an individual so what tools are, are did you use yeah I mean I, so let's let's go back to the the mystical experience right of letting my dog go that was um it was a December 30th of 2013 mm-hmm. and so I'm I'm not a big New Year's resolutions guy, but I love mm-hmm. that time of year because there's this kind of collective energy around change. And so in many ways that are cliche, you know, January 1 was a logical transition point for me. 
And so I, I knew enough about myself at the time to say, you know, this dog has occupied so much space in my life, so much time and energy. And if I don't replace that space with something healthy or some things that are healthy, I know what I'm going to fill it with. And it's going to be more drugs and alcohol. And I don't want to do that. So I started to put, you know, accountability measures in place. Basically, um, I signed up for a marathon. So I started running and training for a marathon. And that was running was always something that I had used as an outlet, but never consistently. I started attending yoga class every week, which led to a whole bunch more mystical experiences. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, I think I mentioned it earlier, I was doing a lot of journaling. Mm, that yes. was, you know, in the beginning, those were my core pieces. I would run, I would write, and once a week I would go to a yoga class. Mm. And I spent hours alone at my desk uh, with a pen and a pad in hand. I spent hours alone on the trail, just running. And mm. since then, I'm, I'm, you know, fortunate that there have been other, for lack of a better term, self-help tools mm -hmm. um, that I've stumbled across. But it always goes back to these basics, physical health, mental and emotional health, and energetic health. Mm. And so, you know, physically, it's either exercise, uh, running, um, lifting, or hitting the heavy bag. Mentally and emotionally, it's uh, writing or, you know, I still engage in, in therapy on a regular basis. I think it's a, it's a wonderful tool. Uh, and then energetically, right, I've, I've picked up other energy arts along the way. So yoga, qigong, tai chi, meditation, martial arts. Uh, and so th that's kind of my core suite of skills right there. Um, I love to dance, which has been something that's been absent in my life over the last couple of years because concerts haven't really been a huge thing um, yeah. <laughs> during the pandemic. But that's another kind of essential piece in my well-being toolkit. And what I find now is I have to ask myself the question of what do I need today, right? Because if anyone out there has a meditation practice, you know, they might be able to resonate with it's really hard to sit down and meditate when you're just fuming mad about something, you know, it's like trying to put a lid on a boiling pot of water. It's not a good idea. Um, sometimes it's great to run. Other times it's great to, to lift heavy things, right. Just to pick them up and put them back down again. And it depends on what mood I'm in, in terms of what I think is going to be the best well-being practice for me in the moment. But those are some of my core skill sets right there for sure. Oh, th those are great. Those are great um, tools that you used. So let's talk about your book now, Soil and Spirit, Seeds of Purpose, Nature's Insight, and the Deep Work of Transformational Change. So that came out in February, correct? Yes, came out February 21st, 2023. Okay, and how, like, can you talk a bit more about the book and how can people get it? Absolutely. Um, you can get the book any online major retailer. Um, soon you'll be able to get the ebook and the audiobook from my website. The book is, I mean, the subtitle really kind of says it all Seeds of Purpose, Nature's Insight, and the Deep Work of Transformational Change. The idea with soil and spirit is trying to hint at this metaphor of there's a foundational substrate of spirit and spirituality. And if we can all tune into that foundation within ourselves, we'll be able to have the impact in the world that we want to have. Seeds of purpose, nature's insight, and the deep work of transformational change. The idea here is that if we develop that self-awareness and we understand the core pieces of purpose within us, and we also recognize that we are natural beings living in a natural world, and we will never be able to escape that paradigm, we have to live in accordance with natural law, not try and control the natural world. We'll be able to create the transformational change that some of us are seeking. And so it's really from a theory of change perspective, inside to out. If we do that internal work, find that internal alignment, we'll be able to create the impact in the social and external landscapes that we want to have 
And I simply choose to classify that as a spiritual process. So that's really what the book is about. Um, there's four main sections, internal landscape, social landscape, external landscape, spiritual landscape. And I kind of think about them as concentric circles or rings. But it's a book for people in transition. It's a book for change makers. It's a book for people who feel they want to have more impact in the world, but aren't necessarily sure how to do it. And it's a book for people who feel that in order to have that impact, they need to be able to learn or be in deeper relation with themselves and one another in order to have that impact. So uh, that's really what the book is about in a nutshell. That's who it's for. Um, it is not a sales book, but from a theory of change perspective, it's the exact same theory of change that I use with organizations. Um, and I should say we, we use with organizations. You know, we're working with organizations to create cultural transformation. And the way that we do that is typically through a three-step process. The first is focusing on process optimization. In other words, organizational development. For those of us that have experience in the working world, you know, I'm sure we have the, the awareness of what it's like to work in an organization that's not fully optimized, right? There are redundant tasks, there are people that there's friction, there's social dynamics that create friction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so our goal is to go in and create more capacity by creating more bandwidth. And so we do that by optimizing the way people work. From there, we feel like we have a greater capacity to have a more sustainable conversation about employee well-being and engagement, really starting to deep uh, do a deep dive into the culture. How do we create an organization that's more resilient by supporting the people within it? And I want to be very clear that we don't come in with our own definition of well-being. We're doing a lot of qualitative analysis to learn about the values of the people within the organization, and we're helping create custom well-being programs context specific to the organization because your definition of well-being is going to be different than my definition of well-being that's and that's true. kind of the second phase third phase is social and environmental impact so if we can bolster the organization and its infrastructure its internal processes we create more capacity to talk about employee well-being and engagement if we can bolster the people's well-being within the organization we're strengthening the organization's ability to have greater social and environmental impact and again, we don't come in with our own definition of what that looks like or what that means. We're doing, a, we're doing a discovery process within the organization to figure out what's important to these people in their community, what are their values, and how do we design uh, custom programming that allows this organization to move beyond the mission of the organization itself, right? The widget that they sell, the service that they provide into a space of what more can we offer our community? What more can we offer the physical world, the, the planet, right? Um, and so we're really driven by values of social justice and, and so climate justice. Um, that's what matters to us. But most importantly, we're invested in people. And we want to create people who are healthier and more resilient because those people are going to be the agents of change that create the change we're seeking in the world. Thank you so much. Before we go, is there any last thing you'd like to tell the listeners? You know, if you want to reach out, if you want to connect, uh, please do. You can find me on all the major social media channels. You can reach out to me through my website, grab a copy of the book. Uh, my email is in the back. Reach out to me. But most importantly, um, remember that the greatest gift you can give the world is saving yourself. And we all lay our heads down on our own pillows at night. And we have to answer the question of, whether we showed up the way we wanted to internally. And we have to decide whether we're going to do that with integrity or not. We've got an opportunity at this time and in this era to create some much needed transformational change. And so in order to do that, in order to be a more effective agent of change, in order to show up more authentically with yourself and one another, Spend time connecting with yourself. Do some self-discovery. Think more deeply about what you're passionate about. Are there changes to make in life? Are there things that you'd like to change or things that you'd really like to hold on to or stay the same? 
engage in that self-reflection process because through that self-awareness, you're going to be shown what it is that you can do. And for those of us who might choose to prefer that language, what it is you're here to do. And I don't mean to suggest that everyone has a single calling or a single purpose, but rather that we all have an opportunity to create that purpose for ourselves in our own lives. And I think that process happens largely internally. So that's what I would encourage for the listeners. I'm obviously happy to connect. Um, I love to connect. But if this half hour inspired you in any way to go into deeper relationship with yourself, that's the greatest gift that you could give to me. Thank you so much for coming on to share your story. And I really appreciate that. Um, thank you, Yen. Thank Absolutely. You so much. Thank you, Abby. Big, big thank you to our guest for, um, for today. And if you would like to learn more about today's topic, please go on howtosurvivesociety.com. There you can get um, some life skills, courses, and some merchandise. And um, contact me if you would like to be a guest on the show. So thank you so much for tuning in. And have yourself a lovely day. Mm-hmm.